What's up y'all, welcome back to Fish the Moment. Today we're talking the flipping tube. This is my favorite technique for catching late pre-spawn and spawning bass. We're gonna be going through how I modify this tube, the entire rigging process, and also the areas I throw this thing in to get some big springtime bass. Let's get into it. First up, what is a flipping tube? It's basically this cylindrical piece of plastic that's hollow in the middle with some crazy tentacles on the end. It's designed to be fished in shallow cover and it can be fished in the exact same places as a flipping jig. However, in the springtime, for whatever reason, I find that late pre-spawn and spawning bass will bite a tube three to one over a jig. They'll even bite this tube better than a creature bait, a Texas rig worm, literally anything you can throw. And I also find that it gets me bigger bites. I've won several tournaments, including two junior state tournaments on this flipping tube, and it is a great way to catch some giant bass. The thing about a tube though is it's a little bit tricky to actually rig and set up because there's a lot of ways you can modify it and there's also some things you have to do to it to increase your hookup ratio. A lot of guys that have tried throwing flipping tubes that I've talked to struggle to actually get fish in the boat on this bait. It may only have a 50% landing ratio where on my tubes, I normally have about a 90 to 95% landing ratio because of all the little modifications I do. So I'm gonna walk you through all these modifications first, then get into the equipment I throw with them and also the areas where I fish these tubes. So here's the tube that I throw. It is a Strike King four and a half inch flipping tube. It was designed back in the 1980s by Denny Brower and he won a Bassmaster Classic actually with this exact bait. It still works great today. The thing about the striking flipping tube that is better than a lot of other flipping tubes is it actually has a solid head to it, but it also has a pretty soft body. There are a lot of other flipping tubes out there that have a solid head, but the bodies are really tough and it makes it hard to get that hook through there and it makes it hard for the fish to collapse that tube. So this is my favorite tube by far. I normally throw it in the black neon color and more dirty water. But you can also throw it in a green pumpkin color or pretty much anything else. Now, there are a lot of things we have to do this tube actually to modify it so that you can get better hookup ratios off of it. But before we actually mess with the tube, I wanna show you how we rig up our hook to also improve those hookup ratios. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take my hook here, which is a 5 aught Gamakatsu EWG uh, hook. It is not like a super line hook or anything. It's just a normal hook. I find that I get better hookup ratios with just a standard hook. I've also tried some of those like Shaw Grigsby HP tube hooks and other like Trocar tube hooks, but I find that just a 5 aught Gamakatsu EWG worm hook works super well. Before we tie this on though, we need to actually get our weight on there. And our weight is going to be a quarter ounce Denali Covert Tungsten weight. I like a quarter ounce size and sometimes go as light as a 3 8 ounce. And I really don't go any heavier than a quarter. This is kind of the heaviest I'll go to, but I'll start with a quarter and then go lighter from there if I feel like the fish are really, really picky. And to really improve those hookup ratios, one thing that I always do is peg my weights. These are just some six cents pegs and it will keep that weight in contact with that tube. And it also will allow you to get into cover a little bit easier. So I think it helps with the hookup ratio a tiny bit and helps with the cover penetration. The way these bobber stops work is you just take one of these strands, you take your line and stick it through there. This is always the hardest part, just getting it through that little eyelet. Then once that line is fully through the eyelet right there, just like that, you're going to pull the bobber stop up your line and now you have a bobber stop on there. I always then go through, I wet my line just with my tongue there slide that bobber stop up, then you put on your tungsten weight. So just throw in your tungsten, there you go. Now that bobber stop is going to stop that weight from sliding up your line, which is going to help peg it to the top of your tube. Then just going to tie on my EWG hook here with a Palomar knot, it's nothing fancy. Um, I'm gonna Usually use a Palomar knot for 95% of my fishing. The only time I actually tie a different knot is I'll tie a Snell knot with braid if I'm like flipping with a straight shank hook. One thing you wanna make sure when you're doing this though is you wanna make sure your lines aren't crossed. You see me kind of twisting it here. Make sure your lines are parallel to each other uh, before you actually tie your Palomar knot. If they're crossed like that, that's when you actually break fish off with fluorocarbon. So just make sure that they're not crossed like that 
and then pull this up and then make sure that that knot gets pulled up with your thumb and you have that loop and all the strands get pulled up like that. And that will also ensure you don't burn your line. Then you just wet it with your tongue and then you slowly cinch that down, pulling both tag ends at the exact same time and just pull slow. If you do that, guys, you're not going to burn your line or anything and you can tie your Palomar knot, which is the fastest knot out there with fluorocarbon, no issues. And I get a lot of questions about that. So hopefully that clears up some stuff. We're now going to trim that tag in and then we're going to have our weight slide down to our hook and then just pull that bobber stop all the way down to our hook. Now that weight is completely pegged in there. It's not going anywhere. It will improve those hookup ratios and it will get it through the cover a little bit better, at least in my experience. Some guys might find they have better hookup ratios without it pegged. I've tried this way and this is just what I do and I find it works, so that's my trick there. So we got our hook and everything and our weight all set up. Next up, we have to get our tube ready. So again, here's our tube out of the package. And the nice thing about these flipping tubes is they're hollow on the inside. There's a hole right here uh, in those tentacles. And what you can do, and something I always do with my tubes, is add some sound to them. There's a bunch of different rattles that you can get on the market. You can get um, like some round rattles, you can get these cylindrical ones, you get these bigger, thicker rattles. I've tried them all. And the big thing about rattles you have to be careful of is that you don't want a rattle that is too round like a ball rattle, because when it's in there, it will take up too much of that uh, tube. And when the fish actually bite down on the tube, it won't compress properly and it will stop the fish from actually eating it. So if that rattle is too thick or too um, wide, those fish won't be able to compress that tube down, which is bad. Same thing with these really big cylindrical tube rattles. They're both thick and they're long, so it takes up a bunch of space in that tube. Again, those fish won't be able to compress it as well, and you will miss fish. And it's a big um, problem I see with a lot of guys too fishing is they just use rattles that are too wide or too long. So I try to find rattles that are both thin and not that long. I'll just put a picture up on the screen because this is kind of hard to show you here, but it's just a really thin, uh, kind of not super long rattle. And what you can do then is you can take this rattle and you can put it up into that tube. You can sometimes wet the rattle if you want to to help it get in there. And you just kind of slide that thing up into the tube and you want to get it as far up into the head of that tube as possible. Remember, the head of that tube is actually solid, so you're not going to be able to push it all the way up to the head, which is fine because you need room for the hook, but you want to get that rattle as far up into that tube as you can. Now, that tube has some rattle to it, which is pretty awesome, and at the same time, the rattle stops right about here, so you still have a good piece of plastic to rig that tube, and that rattle is not getting in the way of your hook point, and we'll show you that what that means in a second. The last thing you gotta do this too before you go any further is you want to actually cut a slot for your hook. Now I'm just gonna take a pair of scissors here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put my scissors into that tube and I'm going to cut about a half an inch to maybe a quarter inch slot into one side of that tube. It doesn't matter where you do it, you just need to make sure you kind of cut it in there. These scissors are not super sharp. So I'm just gonna cut like a little half inch to maybe a three quarter inch groove into that tube. And what that's going to do is give me a space to put my hook and I might even cut a little bit more. And again, it doesn't matter which side you do this on, but you want to cut that groove for your hook to give you a little bit of space for that hook to go in. And now this is your final tube product. It looks the same as actually the one I had pre-rigged before. It looks identical to this. Um, it doesn't look like we did anything to the tube, but just cutting that little slot, adding that rattle make a big difference. The last thing we gotta do here now is just rig our tube. We have our 5 aught EWG Gamakatsu hook, quarter ounce tungsten weight, pegged weight. What we're gonna do is we're gonna find that hook slot at the bottom, so you got the hook slot, and you're going to want to put your hook point into the head and come out the same side as that hook slot we cut. So your hook slot's here and that point of that hook is coming out there as well. Go into the head maybe about a quarter inch. That, that's the hard part of the head. Move it up the shank of the hook and then spin it. That will then get that tube head to be perfectly flush with your weight that's pegged. And now our hook 
goes into that slot that we cut. The slot is literally right here and that hook comes into it right there, which gives it a little bit of space to, to move. And we're just going to come through that slot, come out the other side, just like that. And then we're going to text pose it just like that. So it's now text posed into that tube. Now, a couple key things to call out. One, because that slot is there, it's very easy for those fish to compress that tube and it fl flies out of the way super fast. So you get some bite gap to it. Additionally, that's your bite gap on that tube. When those fish get it, it's right there. And if your bite gap is not compressing like that, let's say it only comes to here, your chances of getting that fish in the boat are a lot smaller. So by cutting that slot, that tube comes down further. And also by having that thinner rattle, it will allow those fish to compress that tube and get a better bite gap. If that rattle is too thick, uh, or too girthy kind of, it will, uh, they won't be able to compress that tube and that bite gap won't be there and that's how you lose your fish. So don't go with those thick rattles. Make sure you're cutting that slot in the tube. Texas rig that up. Now you have a perfect tube. It's going to give you better hookup ratios. It's going to fall through the water well because it's pegged and you're gonna catch a bunch of big fish. Just shake that tube around some shallow cover and you're in business. Now that our tube is fully rigged up and ready to go, let's talk about the equipment I use for this. My go-to setup is a 7'6", heavy action worm and jig rod from the Denali Covert line. It has a really stiff tip to it, but just enough give that you can still, you know, still get a good bend on that hook set and not straighten out your hooks completely. And it has a lot of backbone to pull those fish out of shallow cover. I'll pair that with 20 pound FC Sniper fluorocarbon from Sunline, and I'll even go up to 25 pound test if I'm in really, really thick cover. I try not to go that heavy though with this 5 aught EWG hook I'm using because that sometimes actually will bend it out. So going with 20 pound fluorocarbon gives just enough stretch that you won't bend out your hook, and this rod has just enough tip that there's some give there, and the whole setup works really, really well. As far as my reel, I just go with a six, four to one or seven to one gear ratio. Uh, Abu Garcia Black Max, so like a Max Z, just some $50 reel. I'm not super picky about the reel for this bait. And once I have this whole setup here, I feel very confident that I'm going to be able to get the fish hooked, keep them pinned, pull them out of the cover and get them in the boat. Now that we've gone through my whole tube fishing setup, let's get into the areas I like to throw this bait in. In general, I like to fish this tube around spawning areas, whether that is actually where the bass are laying their beds or right out in front of those areas in the staging areas. In the pre-spawn, I usually like to fish the last channel swing bank in the back of a creek, right where you get that last deep bit of water before it spreads out onto a big flat. Usually in these areas, you're going to have some sort of chunk rock or some sort of laydowns that are set up on that little bit steeper bank. Your boat's gonna be in, let's say, 10 foot of water and you're pitching your tube up into one to three feet of water. The bass will be in a pre-spawn mode there, but they're going to be pretty tight to that cover and it's a great way to catch some big fish on this tube. Now, as those fish slide off of those banks and get into the actual spawning flats, a lot of times they're gonna be setting up around some sort of aquatic vegetation or some type of wood cover. The aquatic vegetation I normally focus on are some sort of water willow grass or shallow bank grass, or on some lily pad stems or some shallow coontail. Basically some sort of shallow grass is in one to three feet of water, and you're looking for holes in that grass or areas where there's some openings where those bass can lay their beds. As far as the wood cover, my go-to cover for this tube is around stumps. If you can find a big flat with some stumps on it, usually those bass are going to be making their beds on the base of those stumps. You can pitch those tube, this tube right to that stump, shake it in place with that rattle in there, and those fish can't stand it. You can also catch some fish around laydowns and things like that with this tube, but usually the stumps are my go-to area, and the way you can find those is either on a sunny day, just visually identifying them, or you can actually scan a big flat with your side imaging and find those stumps on your side scan in one to two foot of water, mark them, and then come back and pitch them. And that's actually how I won one of those state championships, uh, junior state championships back in the day. It's literally side scanning a flat in two foot of water and then pitching stumps that no one else was fishing with that tube. So that is a great way to put some fish in the boat as well. You can also fish the tube in a variety of other places that 
you know, hold fish in the pre-spawn and in the spawn. It's a really versatile bait. So don't get caught up too much on the exact spots that you fish this tube. Just experiment with it in different areas. Also experiment with the color. My favorite color is obviously that black neon in that dirtier water, but you can catch them on a green pumpkin color, a watermelon color tube. There's a lot of different colors on the market. So just experiment with the color, experiment with the areas, but make sure you're using the similar setup so you can actually get them in the boat. And if you do all that, we will be putting some big fish in the boat this spring. So thanks for checking out this video, guys. Hopefully it was helpful and you learned something. Make sure to subscribe to the Fish Moment YouTube channel for more content just like this. We'll see you all in the next video.